The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Heaven is Like That, starring Marguerite Chapman and John Lund. Licia Albanese is your hostess. More things are wrote by prayer that this world dreams of. Man's deepest desire is for peace. It is part of our human heritage of right living. We want peace in our hearts and in our homes. We look for peace with our fellow men and among nations. That is why pray, family prayer is so important in all homes today. Important for ourselves, for our families, for the world. Because when we gather as a family to pray, to ask God for peace in our homes, we are also asking for God's blessing on the world. Family prayer is the way to true peace everywhere. A wonderful way because it's God's way. Miss Albanese will return later in the program. Now Family Theater presents Heaven is Like That, starring Marguerite Chapman and John Lund. The scene is London. At his flat in the smart West End district, Christopher Lane is giving a party. As they always do, Christopher's guests are enjoying themselves immensely. And as for Christopher himself... Uh, Mr. Lane, sir. Yes, Wilson? I beg your pardon, sir, but it's Dr. Rogers. Rogers? Ask him in. I took the liberty, sir, but he says he must speak to you privately. I can't do that. I have guests. He said it was most important, sir. Oh, well. Excuse me, all of you. Rogers, old man? Hello, Chris. I thought you were going to ring me up the morning after I examined you. I've got to talk to you. All right. What's the trouble? Chris, in many ways, the medical profession has made great strides. In others... Yes? We've failed. There are certain diseases we've been unable to conquer. One of them is a very rare blood condition called leukemia. Yes, I've heard of it. Then you undoubtedly heard, too, that at least certain cases are incurable. Oh, yes, I think I knew that. I read... Wait a moment. You're... You're not trying to say that... that I... That... that's just what I am trying to say, son. I don't believe it. I'm as well as you are. I would have said so, too, but it so happens that blood tests don't lie. I'm sorry, Chris, believe me. Leukemia. And there's... there's nothing to be done? Naturally, we will try treatment, but... How long? I want the truth. Well, a year at most. Possibly... Even less. A year at most. A drink, Dr. Rogers? Uh, no, Chris, and you shouldn't either. In your condition, alcohol is most dangerous. It might even hasten... Well, why not? Here, I give you a toast. Chris. A little out of season, but still fitting. Very fitting. Dr. Rogers, I give you a happy new year. <laughs> You heard me, girl. I said another brandy double. I heard you, sir. But begging your pardon, sir, shouldn't you call it quits? After all, you had a good many before you came here. Give over, Amy. Let the gentleman have his drink if he wants it. All right. Here you are, sir. <sighs> Thank you. God blimey. He downs him just like Ily does. Yeah, your money. How about a cab, sir? It's like no part of London for a gentleman, especially a night the likes of this, and you on steady life. How do you like that? 
I likes it, I me. I likes it. That's uh, still not clear. You, you say you found me on the street? About two hours ago. No one else to help you. I just couldn't leave you lying there. So I brought you where I live. Mrs. Farney, my landlady, says you can stay right here in the parlor until you're feeling all right again. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got work to do in my room. I'm packing. Oh, wait. Tell me, who are you? My name's Eileen, sir. You say you're packing. What for? Oh, I have to leave here in the morning. Unless I get a job, that is. I see. What kind of job have you been looking for? Oh, I'm in service. I was downstairs made to Mrs. Gamma for two years. Until she died last autumn. That's where I got this. Oh, a silver teapot. It's lovely, Eileen. Mrs. Gamma gave it to you? Oh, heavens no. Not her. I left it on the fire one day, and one leg melted off. See? It's just taped on now. She was frightfully angry. Took full payment from my wages. So now it's my personal private treasure, in a way. All I've got, that is. I should say it was a treasure. A beautiful one, Eileen. Of course, first I'll have to have it mended for him. To make his tea, I mean. Him? Don't tell me you have a husband. Oh, not yet. But when I get one. I will, of course, someday. Oh, I'm sure you'll get the very best of all possible husbands. And now... Oh, are you going? Yes, I believe I can manage now. You've been more than kind. I'd like to show my appreciation by leaving... What is it? A minor matter, young lady, but I'll trouble you for my wallet. I don't know what you're talking about. There were 50 pounds in my wallet when I left home tonight. 50 pounds? But, oh, Lord, that's what they were about. Who? When I was coming up to you, I saw some men beside you, but they disappeared into the fog. <laughs> it's absurd, but I believe you. There's every reason in the world for me to think you're lying, but I know somehow that you're not. Then you know what's true. I never lie. Eileen, will you answer me one question? I'll try. What would you do if you had only one year to live? I'd pray. And after that? I don't know. I never thought. I, I guess I'd try to decide just who to give the teapot to. That's really all you'd think about. But what about yourself? What about filling those last months with all the pleasure you could find? Who ever heard of finding happiness by going out and looking for it? But one could find it in giving things away? Of course. Eileen, suppose instead of just a silver teapot, you had, let's say, a thousand pounds to give away. <laughs> you might as well say twenty thousand. All right. I will say 20,000. You see, I do have just a year to live. Oh. oh, it's not true. Oh, it's true enough. And because it's true, I'm interested in what you say. Suppose I were to spend my last year the way you'd spend it in my place. Do you think that you could, could help me? You mean, help you give the money away? Just that. Why do you need help? Just do it. But you know where there's real need, Eileen. I don't. I'll wager you could think right now of a dozen people we could be of assistance to. Yes. I suppose I could. Of course you could. It would be easy. Will you do it, Eileen? Are you sure you're sober now? Yes, quite sober. And you're not crazy? It's hard to tell these days. And I'm not crazy. Why would you be doing it? Why? I'm not quite sure, Eileen. Maybe it's because my year is suddenly very precious to me. I'd prefer to have it filled with happiness. I've already tried other recipes for that. They never worked. Perhaps yours will. <laughs> Eileen, you did come. Didn't I say I would? I'd begun to think you wouldn't be here. Oh, I'm sorry, my dear. I was delayed at my bank. 
Well, here's the first installment. Well, take it, Eileen. A thousand pounds? Actually, a thousand quid. And in my own hands. I suppose you've already figured how to dispose of it. Oh, yes, I have. It's 400 to Mrs. Divers, 300 for Emilio, 400 and Never mind for... the details. I'm leaving that to you. I'll bring receipts. It should be done by 4 o'clock. Good. Then I'll meet you at my flat. Oh, oh, I couldn't do that. No? It'd be oddly proper, sir. Well, uh, at your place, then? That's not much better. I see. Well, uh, where can you suggest, uh, considering all the proprieties, I mean? Well, there's always a public park. Hyde Park, for instance, near Marble Arch. All right. Hyde Park near Marble Arch it is, at 4 o'clock. Very good, sir. Uh, and look, my name is Christopher. Christopher Lane. Yes, Mr. Lane. Christopher? Yes, Mr. Christopher. You win. Goodbye, Eileen, till 4 o'clock. Yes? Would you be Mr. Christopher Lane, sir? Yes, yes, I'm Christopher Lane. Well, a girl told me to give you this. Oh, thank you. Oh. oh. I say, sir. Have I been fetching all that money and without even knowing it? Yes. A thousand pounds. Listen, son. Where was the girl when she gave this to you? At Mrs. Farney's room and house on Burberry Street. She was near to crying, sir. Here, take this for your trouble. Oh, I say. A pound note. Thank you, sir. Taxi! Taxi here! But you shouldn't have come, Mr. Christopher. I sent you back the money. Why? That's what I want to know. Eileen, you've been crying. Suppose I have. Girl has a right to cry if she wants to. Oh, most certainly. She usually has a reason as well. Do you want to tell me? No. Then perhaps I can tell you. Your friends wouldn't take the money you were so anxious to give them. How did you know? Mr. Christopher, I don't understand it. Mrs. Divers was all of a sudden angry when I offered it. She said whatever gave me the idea that she would take charity. But surely you didn't stop with Mrs. Davis. Oh, no. Milio's father said I must have stolen the money. <laughs> Eileen, you've just overlooked one thing. The pride of the very poor. It's infinitely stronger than the pride of the very rich. What can we do? People won't take help when it's offered them. Well, perhaps we can masquerade it a little, Eileen. We can make it look like Providence. And there's no one so poor he doesn't still believe in Providence. How do you mean? Well, suppose you leave that part of it to me. Very well, Mr. Christopher. Look, you couldn't call me just plain Chris. Oh, no, sir. It'd be oddly proper, with my being in service and you a gentleman. Eileen, do you know that you're an anachronism? Oh, I hope not, sir. Is that something one gets over? In your case, I doubt it very much. But you will go through with our bargain now. I don't know. There's something else? Yes, what is it? I, I don't think I could stand it. Stand what? Well, you know how it is. When you're around someone you like a good deal, even just working with them, you sometimes get attached to them. In a respectful sort of way, I mean. And you're afraid you'd get attached to me? I couldn't help it. And then to see you day after day, always knowing in my heart that, that you were... Only waiting for... I just couldn't. You mean it's my dying you're afraid of? Not just the dying, but... But after. If we knew just what was beyond it, it might be different. But I do know. And because I know, I'm not afraid. You really know? Tell me, what's it like? Like? Eileen... When in all your life were you the happiest? 
in all my life. I guess it was the summer Mrs. Gamma took a country house. In Devonshire it was. Yes, I know Devonshire. Oh, do you now? Then you must know what I mean. The soft green rolling hills and the valleys in between with primroses and daffodils in bloom and the houses almost like they were painted against the sky. Well, Eileen, it's very much like that. You mean after? Yes. You see, most people never realize that heaven is really our fondest memories recaptured and our greatest hopes all realized. Yes. More even than we've dreamed. Heaven is, is like that for you, too. For me, too, Eileen. So surely that's no place for either of us to be afraid of, is it? Would seem foolish. Of course it would. And now let's get to work. All right. Here's a list of people I made out. Oh, yes. We'll take them one at a time. Now, first, there's Mrs. Davis. Let me see. What would be the best antidote for her overdose of pride? Mrs. Davis, I am here to represent the firm of Lane, Morgrave and Swithin. It appears that a certain sum of money has been bequeathed to you. Money? Bequeathed to me? Uh, shall I say, willed? Now I wonder, could that be me cousin Melinda in New York? Poor dear soul. She was very wealthy, I heard. Uh, the details will be furnished later, Mrs. Davis. The sum is 397 pounds, nine shillings and sixpence halfpenny. Now, if you'll please sign this receipt uh, for our file. But the law firm I represent feels your store is worth 4,000 pounds, Mr. Tompkins. And it's only right that a man of your years should retire in comfort. I know it's old furniture, Mrs. Higgins, but I'm interested in purchasing antiques. Of course, since your daughter's ill, we needn't disturb things right away. But if you'll accept payment now... What's our total now? Do you have the figure? I was just checking them. We've given out a total of 15,400 pounds. Well, not bad for eight months' work, is it, Eileen? Not bad at all, sir. That's nearly 2,000 a month, just as we planned it. I know. Oh, here, here. Why are you so depressed today? And how many times have I told you to buy a new dress? But I have, sir. Each time you've told me. Well, then each new one must look just like the old one. Each new one is just like the old one. But that's absurd. And what about your hair? You've never fixed it right. Eileen. Yes, Mr. Christopher? Don't you realize that the Lord made you beautiful because he wanted you that way? Did he, sir? Now, tomorrow I want your hair done properly. You understand? That's an order. If you have any idea of making a lady of me, you're wasting time. But you are a lady in everything that matters. I'm not. I'm a servant girl, and I know my place. Well, maybe... Maybe class distinctions aren't always as important as they used to be. They are to me. Eileen, listen to me. For months now, I've wanted to tell you... Mr. Christopher, we have work to do, and we'd better get back to it. All right, Eileen. You know... You're either a very wise girl or a very foolish one. I wish I were sure myself. Dr. Rogers will see you now, Mr. Lane. Thank you. Oh, hello, Chris. Dr. Rogers, what do you know of Dr. Anton Marx? Marx, I've met him. He's just come here from Vienna. Yes, and there was a report in the paper this morning that he has a cure for leukemia, an operation. I know about that, Chris. You knew? And I decided not to tell you. Marx has a theory and nothing more. The operation he proposes has never been performed. Of course, any patient submitting to it would be serving science, I suppose, even if only by proving the theory false. But as to his surviving the operation... Yes, what chance would he have? One in 500. And in my case... Without the operation, how long have I? 
I can't be positive. You've altered things considerably by the life you're living now. If you'd gone on as you were, you wouldn't be on your feet today. You may have another six months, Chris. I see. Well, I'll take my six months. And Dr. Marx can find someone else for his experiment. <laughs> Well, you did wear another dress. You said I had to. What's happening? You said you had special plans this evening. You'll see. I finished the accounts. It's all... all spent. Good, good. That means our job is done. I know. Eileen, come here. Well? Look. A dinner party. There are only two places. For us? Have you forgotten what night this is? What night? An anniversary, Eileen. It was a year ago tonight that you discovered me on Burberry Street. But there's another reason for tonight. I wanted to give you this. What is it? A deed, Eileen. A deed to a farm in Devonshire. Green rolling hills with flowers in the valleys and just one house that looks painted against the sky. You didn't. Why should I give to everyone else but not to the one person who taught me the real joy of giving. Oh, Mr. Christopher. Eileen, will you go there with me for whatever time is left? I, I want to ask you to... I can't. You mustn't ask me. I want you to marry me, Eileen. Who am I to marry you? You're the girl I love. The girl who loves me. And if I do love you, what does it matter? that make us any less far apart? Well, that makes no difference, Eileen, least of all now. But it does. It must. You're going to marry me. No, I'm not. I'm going away. Our work is done. Our agreement's ended. So I'll... I'll, I'll just say goodbye, Mr. Christopher. Eileen, Eileen, you can't have understood. I love you. Please let me go. And forgive me if I can't stay for the party. But I couldn't. Why'd you have to put it into words? Oh, wait. At least let me send you home in a taxi. No. If, if I'm going back to my own life, I'd as well start right now. I'll take the underground. Goodbye. Eileen. Make pawn, sir, but wouldn't you like more light in here? No. Still wouldn't care to eat? No, just leave me alone, will you? Here's a special Turn announcement from wire. the BBC. Very good, sir. A serious accident occurred in the London Underground less than an hour no, ago. No, wait. An unknown number of persons are dead and scores injured in the crash near Burberry Street Station. Burberry Street? Further Mr. details Lee, will sir, be broadcast wrong? as soon as received. And we hope within the hour that the full is And we've done everything possible, Mr. Lane. But with a spinal fracture, well... And, and there's no hope at all. Oh, I'm sorry. May I go in now? Well, certainly. Eileen. <laughs> Mr. Christopher. No, I really have spoiled the anniversary. I haven't I? Are you... Are you all right? I'm all right. I hope I didn't cause you too much worry. Funny, too. I ran to catch that train. Eileen. Yes? Surely it doesn't matter now. Matter? The, the gentleman and the serving girl, that couldn't make a difference at a time like this. I don't suppose it could. I do love you, Eileen. So much. And I love you. There must be a clergyman in the hospital. All right. I'd be happy to marry you, Chris. And whom God had 
joined together, let no man put us under. Thank you. Eileen. About the teapot. You'd, you'd better give it to some girl who's not married. I will. And have it mended so she can make tea for her man when she finds him. I'll, I'll have it mended. Christopher. Yes. Would, would you tell me once again? Tell you? What it's like after heaven is really? Our fondest memories recaptured. Our greatest hopes all realized. Yes, and more. Because eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for those who love him. And there's nothing to be afraid of because... Eileen. Eileen. Chris, it's still not too late for you to change your mind. But I'm not going to, Rogers. Don't do it. I beg you. Forget that you ever heard of this operation. But I did hear of it. And I'm glad. All right, I'm ready. Very well. We'll take him into surgery, nurse. Oh, Rogers, there's just one thing. Well? The chances for my coming through this little session, what did you say they were? One in 500. I wish it were one in a thousand. John Lund and Marguerite Chapman have starred in tonight's family theater presentation, Heaven is Like That. Now, here is your hostess, Licia Albanese. There is a joy here now in the knowledge that we shall meet those we love hereafter. There is a special joy we, as parents, have in this knowledge, for we have the happiness of knowing that we are making sincerest efforts to bring up our children to be God-respecting, God-loving citizens for here and hereafter. You'll never know what peace and happiness and understanding can be in your home until you've tried praying together as a family, because a family that prays together stays together. This is Lich Albanese saying goodbye, and God bless you. Before saying goodnight, we wish to thank Marguerite Chapman and John Lund for their splendid performances. Our thanks to True Boardman for writing tonight's play, and to Max Tare for his music. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Others who appeared in tonight's play were Dick Ryan, Eric Snowden, Julie Bennett, Buddy Gray, Lester Jay, and Maudie Prickett. Next week, our Family Theater stars will be Fibber McGee and Molly in Advice to the Lovelorn with Don DeFore as host. This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by a friend of the New York Foundling Hospital which cares for homeless and motherless babies without distinction of race, creed, or color. Join us next week at the same time when our Family Theater stars will be Marion and Jim Jordan, better known as Fibber McGee and Molly. Don DeFore will be your host. Tony Lafrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.